let us regather our mind again and be in the presence of God. So I just encourage you to be aware that God is here and just rest in him. Tonight, let's pray that the knowledge of scripture will not, will not puff us up. But whatever we learn will shape us, uh, shape our faith, that we grow stronger in faith, that we are uh, sure of our salvation. We're sure of God's sovereignty and lordship that allow us to love the unlovable, and even to forgive ourselves and to look at ourselves differently in the eyes of God. That knowledge of the scripture will increase our faith in um, taking risks in the way that we sometimes give to those who are in need and um, committing to the things that we might feel uh, adverse to, but we feel that we're called into it because that's where God is leading us. So let us pray that our faith, uh, that the knowledge of the scripture will increase our faith to live in God and to have a richer relationship with God. Father, we pray tonight for your um, guidance. We have to learn about the scripture. And there is inevitably increasing of knowledge. But God, we pray that the knowledge will not puff us up. That you will not make us feel better than someone else who doesn't know or does not have access to um, information that we hold or we might be learning and certainly god we pray that we will not look down upon those who don't participate in like devo or that we think it, we are just one cut above everybody else uh, but god i pray that everything we learn will help us to uh, humble ourselves and to participate to see our life through perspective of faith in the, in the way that we accept ourselves, where we interact with others, and um, the approaches that we have in life. God, I pray that we will have um, compassion upon ourselves, and we have compassion upon other people. And then we want your spirit to do that through the scripture. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, oh, man, man. All right. Let's see. Let's let me get rid of some screens over here tonight. I am going to share with you something that is super duper boring, and that is um, genealogy. 
if I can get this right. Okay. All right, here we go. So we're continuing on with Luke, and I'm careful not to touch upon the sermon text that's coming up um, when I'm gone. So I, I want to fill in the gaps between the sermon texts. And, and this week, I want Luke is uh, Matthew records the genealogy of Jesus right off the bat, and he wants to establish uh, who Jesus is from the beginning by listing his family tree. Luke is not like that. Um, I try to think about why he introduces genealogy a little bit later in his gospel. Maybe the fact that he is not a Jewish person um, or his, he's trying to say something in the beginning, things like that, that Messiah is revealing himself to the elderly, to the barren, uh, people who are hopeless, people who are poor. Those things are, maybe he wants to emphasize on things like that. Uh, whatever the reason, uh, Luke has his genealogy later in his gospel. Typically, when, when it comes to genealogy, we, we think it's boring because, I mean, it is. Um, countless names that we can't pronounce. Sometimes it's pages after pages, like entire chapters dedicated to names. And um, we read it. We don't get any spiritual value from it. It's like eating... Uh, one of those fiber cereals, but the fiber is made out of like wood bark. You know, some way the <laughs> maple, maple tree bark and just kind of put a Vitamix and just grind it up and that's what you're eating and that's what you feel like. Anyway, but I, what, what I want to say to you is genealogy crops up all over the place in the Bible. Obviously it's there because it's important. And one of the things that I, I want to do tonight is to uh, to tell you that genealogy, yes, it is boring. I find it boring, and I don't read them every single time I encounter it. Um, but when I do study them, when I do sit down, meditate on it, carefully uh, trace names and things like that, it is really, really meaningful. Um, and so I, I just want to give dignity to the entire scripture, even the places that we, we think is boring. Okay, And at the end of uh, a my spiel, um, we, will do, we, we will dedicate some time for meditation upon the genealogy in the Bible uh, of, of Luke in the Gospels, okay? So is it the most boring part of the Bible? Maybe, but before we move on, I just want to share with you 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verses 3 to 4, but more really, uh, more just 4. Uh, Paul is telling Timothy to make sure that people don't devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promotes uh, speculations rather than stewardship from uh, God that is by faith. So um, the genealogies here, Paul probably is talking about how um, Pharisees kind of trace their family tree because that's very important to them. Um, and try to prove that their lineage is of some value, some importance. And, uh, or it could be also talking about genealogy of Christ. And when you look at Luke and Matthew's genealogies, they don't match. Uh, and and not, not even close on parts. So, you know, there's a lot of discrepancies and, and people kind of wonder why. And people have been arguing about it, and scholars have come up, came up with uh, various solutions that satisfies um, why it might be different in, in different ways. But there's no perfect uh, explanation as to why these uh, names are different. And the critics of Christianity will use that and say, "Look, um, the family trees look different. There are parts that are look they, they, they they're different. So uh, Jesus can't be the Messiah. This is all made up." But our I, our but for Paul it is, look, I know who Jesus is. Like the experience of Jesus that I had goes beyond the discrepancies and. Um, mismatching of names and these only promote speculations um, there might be some differences in, in the way that which line luke and matthew might be focusing or tracing 
sometimes maybe it's more Mary, it might be more uh, Joseph, and that there might be some uh, differences there, whatever the case might be. But uh, Paul, Paul's thing is, knowing Christ is much more profitable than uh, lining up all the names. So I, I just want to um, deal with that before we uh, move any further. And, and the idea is that, you know, it's not knowledge, but having the knowledge of Christ, experience of Christ that will form our faith. Okay. So uh, here we go. Uh, gene I, I want to start with the genealogy of that is found in Book of Matthew. Uh, Matthew, uh, first, there are three sections in, in Matthew's genealogy. And I, I, the first section is from Abraham to David. So he doesn't start right from Adam, which Luke does, but he starts with Abraham and goes to David. And I've highlighted um, three names here, uh, Tamar and Rahab and Ruth. And I just kind of want you to lock that into your mind because, uh, you know, when, when you read Luke, Luke has all these woman stuff, you know, like prophetess Anna, Mary, Elizabeth, and, and healing of woman and, and, and things like that. And, and he gives all his dignity to women. And Matthew kind of doesn't, but yet at the same time, right off the bat, Matthew includes four, no, five ladies' names um, in, in the genealogy. And that is just, I don't want to say rare. I, I don't want to say unfounded, but we know that from antiquity, you, you don't mention woman's name. Certainly when you read Old Testament uh, genealogies, you'll never, ever find, not one case, where mother's name is mentioned, but it's not so with uh, Matthew. He includes them in all three sections. Okay, so first section, Abraham to David, and the next section is uh, genealogy of Jesus from David to deportation to Babylon. Okay, so Abraham who, who leaves his home, goes on, goes on a journey, desert journey, and to David, and from David now to deportation. And in this second section, um, he also mentions wife of Uriah, which is Bathsheba. And David, uh, you know, Bathsheba was wife of Uriah, uh, the Hittite. So maybe Bathsheba was also uh, Gentile in origin. We're not sure, but uh, certainly um, over here, we have Tamar, she's Gentile. Rahab is a Gentile. Ruth oh, is Moabitess, and she's a Gentile. And so that um, pattern of Gentile woman in, in the family tree of Jesus is, is very apparent, and it is very striking. Um, it, it's kind of the names that you don't want to mention in your family tree, because Tamar slept with, his, uh, with her father-in-law, Judah, Rahab, some people consider a prostitute, but who knows? And Ruth is Moabitess, and, and they're hated. Israelites hate Moabites and uh, Moabites. Uh, and so it, to include her is, is kind of interesting, include ladies like that. And the third part, third and last part of genealogy of Matthew is from deportation. So there's Abraham, there's a great kingdom that David has built. And that gets demolished and they get deported. And from deportation to Jesus, there is one woman's name, and that is Mary. She is Jewish, uh, Jewish of course. And I just want to highlight to you that um, there were 14 generations in each section. So Abraham to David, there are 14 names from David to deportation, 14 names, from deportation to Jesus, 14 names. So 14 times three, that's 42. And, and Matthew, is, Matthew is playing with numbers to show that Jesus is, is significant. And um, I, I don't know if I'll get into that um, unless I actually put it down. So let's, let's talk about genealogy, genealogy of Jesus and Matthew. Uh, you saw the five names there. Um, what is the significance of including woman's name in the family tree of Jesus? 
and this is speculation, right? So let's talk about given like knowing the information that I've given to you, what are some of the significance of having these women's name recorded in the scripture? What where's the chat? That's right. Um, out of five ladies in there, first four are uh, Gentile. Only Mary is Jewish. Maybe that maybe that the promises of God are not limited to just men or just Jews. That's right. That it already built into um, Jesus' family tree is. Um, Gentiles. Okay, um, some people will see that as you know his family tree is not very pure, but if God is God of all, then um, it, it would some you would assume it would be natural to have Jew, uh, Gentiles in the family tree that are women. Like all these all these things, if you just take a moment to think about it, it's really significant. God values women, both Jews and Gentiles, yes. And uh, what do you guys think about um, Tamar's sexual history and Bathsheba's sexual history? That, that Bathsheba um, basically committed adultery, had a baby with King David. Right? What, does, what does all this mean in the family tree of Jesus? If you if you notice that, what kind of meditation could you possibly have? It's a hard question. So let's just think about it. Let's just pause for a moment and think about that. Hey, I like, I like. Their checker pass does not prevent God from fulfilling his will. Yeah, that's really beautifully said. Um, that God is not coming, his, his coming, his promise, his covenant is not being um, ultimately hampered by human sin or brokenness or momentary weaknesses or by ethnicity. So God is God must be God of all, and God must be coming to address the brokenness of the world, not only of women, because if you look at some of the names in his genealogy, it's pretty messed up. Like you know, guys' names, it's pretty messed up too, right? So yeah, whoa, lots of comments. Okay, so that's something that you you and I can't meditate upon for a long time, and 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 that may hit your past. Um, I don't think any one of us here had that who might have been um, alcoholic or abusive or something, but that you're not some of your father's or mother's sins, that you're not going to simply, your life is not just summation and ultimation of the generation past, but God has the power to restore and you are ultimately you and God. So these are the things that you can really meditate upon, okay? But I'm gonna, I really want to read what you had to say. Uh, it is possible that specifically the women in the genealogy are Gentiles, so that there is no question that there are Gentile blood. That there is Gentile blood? Yeah. If they were men, uh, you could question if the baby was actually a, oh, that is so interesting. Yeah. Okay. Did everyone get that? That's, that's really cool. 
It is imperfect slash weak. God uses the weak and amen to that. Uh, weak is the wrong word. Well, um, yes, you're right, but um, they, they are weak and inferior in the eyes of Jews, right? Like Moabites, they, they, their past is really checkered. Like they have like weird incestual uh, origin and beginning. So they, they really didn't like them. The Jewish people really didn't like them. Kind of like the Hobbit. Um, unlikely characters are used. <laughs> okay. Um, Jesus is all about grace and mercy. That is correct. And, and, and there is no history. There is no ethnicity. There's no culture. Um, or mistakes, perhaps, uh, of men and women that God cannot address and that God is not willing to look at. Uh, he is there, sort of like a doctor or hospital. They'll look at you and they'll treat you. And they don't say, well, you're, you're Asian or you have long hair or your disease is too rare, so we're not going to care. But Jesus is, God is the ultimate healer, ultimate doctor. He embraces all. So genealogy, when you look at it that way, it's like really eye-opening. It's like, wow. Um, the second question, I, I'm going to answer it because I don't think it's really a good question. Sometimes I think about these questions. I'm like, oh, I think it's discussion worthy, but it's not. Um, so from Abraham to David, there's a ascending pattern. So it's like, yay, we're becoming a nation, individual becoming a nation. And we have become a nation, Mr. David, and now deportation, and we're becoming individuals again, just being scattered like a uh, chaff in the wind, you know. And then from that genealogy of David to deportation, those names are included, you know. It's not just um, Abraham to David and forget the deportees and, and exiles, but those names are there. And, and, and God continues. He includes all the names in their entire history as to say, I've been sovereign in every part of your life, that your existence itself is proof that I exist because I have chosen the weak to shame the strong, right? I mean, where is Persia today um, or, or Assyria? I mean, Persia is technically Iran, I guess, but uh, these empires have dissolved. But this weakling, Israel, is still remains. And, and, and uh, that's why Israelites were so meticulous in writing down names. And they kept all the names and family trees because it was so important to them because God was working in their history. And God will see to it so that they, their land is preserved and their nation is preserved. So from deportation to Jesus is like Abraham to David, ah, like, you know, downhill deportation and from deportation to Jesus. And another nation is coming to fruition. Um, David's kingdom fell, sort of, uh, sort of speak, but Jesus' kingdom, Jesus, who is line of David, his kingdom will be eternal because that's what God has promised to David. That the eternal kingdom is not his earthly throne, but of heavenly throne that is found in Christ. Okay. Um, oh, oh, I have another comment. Yay. I think it's also a very strong juxtaposition where the heroes of Jewish history, example, uh, David and Bathsheba, sin just as much or more than the Gentiles in genealogy. But God redeemed them the same. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. It's... Um, I mean, uh, to use the words by Linda is there, everyone's past is checker. And, um, you know, one of the things that kind of I, I think about is all the dumb things that I've done in the past. I'm like, wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> how did I become a pastor? No? So it's, it just gives, opens up, like opens a door of hope. Um, not because it happened to certain few individuals, but it happened in the history of Israel. Like that's what's beautiful about the scripture. And that's what's beautiful about God, that his story is, is, is happening in actual history. 
it's not just the abstracted religious ideas of like, this is how you pray. Um, these are the heavenly treasures that will come to you if you say certain words, or these are moral codes that I want you to have. But they, there's actually names and histories and events and God's faithfulness being played out in history. So that's really cool. Really, really cool. Um, let's see the time here. Of course, I can't tell, but um, I imagine it's about 7.35. Anyway, uh, Matthew writes 14 names in three sections. And really, what is up with that? And you may have heard of something called numerology. And Matthew might be doing something. Matthew probably is doing something like that. 14 times 3 is um, 42, 42. And I heard scholars say things like uh, 6 times 7. And I know this seems like really like arbitrary and just kind of pulled out of a hat kind of thing. But um, these numeric assignment and significances actually do exist. And, and, and they're not really without a merit. Um, and and I, I wouldn't be surprised if Matthew is doing that um, with, with 14 times 3. So Matthew is not just writing all the names um, and then just making a 14 times 3, but he, he might be, what he might be doing is uh, 14 times 3 equals 42, 6 times 7 is 42, and if Jesus is seen as someone who completes the 6 to 7. So sixth day of creation and seventh day of Sabbath. So he's the one who brings Sabbath and he's the one who creates and he's the one who completes that creation cycle with Sabbath. So there, there might be something like that. Um, I know that the book of Proverbs, the number of Proverbs um, equals the number of solemn, uh, num how do I say this? So every letter in Hebrew uh, are signed a number, like A is not a Hebrew name, but Aleph is sign number one, and so on and so forth. B is 13, C is 15, 16, whatever. And, and then Solomon, the name Solomon, when you add those, add the numbers up in his name, will equal the number of Proverbs in the book of Proverbs. And I, I forget what the number is. But um, so Jewish people like to have these very complicated um, numerology behind the scene, and they're often at work. So just something interesting to look at. But again, uh, like like Paul said, you know, don't get caught up on it too much. But they're in there, and 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 author is trying to say something through that. Okay. Now we're going to genealogy of Jesus in the gospel of Luke. Um, let's kind of move through this. He doesn't have three sections. It, it, you know, Matthew has like very strong segments. Uh, he does not. Um, and I'm just going to give away some of the answers here uh, because we don't have time. Uh, Matthew begins with uh, Abraham and he goes to Jesus, right? So Abraham, blah, 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 oldest to the new. Um, what the way that Luke does it is he goes from Jesus back into all the way past Adam, like David, Adam, and he goes all the way to, no, sorry, sorry. He goes to David, Abraham, and all the way to Adam. So he goes all the way to Adam, while Matthew only goes up to Abraham. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And he records actually 70 names instead of 42 names. And um, there are some discrepancies. People have been arguing about it, talking about it, and there are some solutions, but I, I, I'm not gonna get into it because I don't even really understand them myself. Um, too, too, too lazy to understand, I guess. Uh, key differences. Um, I, I shared all of these things with you. Um, Matthew has 42 names, Luke has 77. And 77 might be um, something like, uh, well, I think it might be something like um, when Genesis in Hebrew, it says, you know, God made the sun and God made the stars and land and separate. And then each day God says good. But on the last day, God says very good. And that very good in Hebrew is just really saying good twice. Good, good. 
And number seven is sign of perfection. It's a perfect number. It just, it just is uh, in a Jewish mind. So having seven, uh, seven, like creation is done in seventh day. And six is considered incomplete. And so on the seventh day, it was created, and the seventh day is Sabbath. So there are there is completion and 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 Sabbath uh, assigned to number seven, and seven seven means Sabbath Sabbath rest rest, which just may mean like really amazing rest rest. So Jesus uh, is coming of Jesus. It's not just a, a random act in history. This is a person that they've been waiting for. And um, he is in Matthew, maybe it means he's the one who completes the six to into seven, right? And it kind of makes sense because um, when you look at the Tamar, uh, David and Bathsheba, you know, they're all kind of like sixes. They're, they're, there's something missing in their life and they're struggling to get it. And Tamar resorts to her guile and then tricks um, her father-in-law to sleeping with her and then she gets pregnant. I know it's a weird story for those of you who is encountering, who is encountering this for the first time, but they're, they're, all these people are sixes and the entire history is a six and Jesus is making it into seven. And then Luke is seven, seven. This, this is the one that we've been waiting for and Jesus is the one who will give us Sabbath, Sabbath, real, true, eternal rest. So that might be all at play in here. Um, Matthew uh, is stopping at Abraham because he's writing to the Jewish population and he wants he wants to, he wants his brother uh, Jewish brothers and sisters to know that Jesus is a Jewish king like this is it man and Luke being a Gentile and Luke who also wrote book of Acts and in the world mission uh, he goes all the way to Adam to say that Jesus is the hope of all humanity okay so the, these are uh, significant differences in these two genealogies. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, please. Um, yeah. Um, I, you know what? I'm not going to go into this. Skip. All right, now we're at the meditation. Um, I want you to maybe pick one of the three, okay? And, and I want you to meditate on the woman. Uh, in, in Matthew's genealogy. What does that mean to you? And how does that connect to you? All the, all the six, um, is, is God going to be the seven for you? You know what I mean? Um, is there, do you have a checkered past that you want to um, bring up and trust that God will restore, heal you, and that this is not the end, that there is... <laughs> I feel like I work at casino, but there, there is number seven coming. There's a perfection that is coming and God will dry up your tears. And maybe that's something that you want to meditate on. Um, maybe in a similar way, but a little bit different. Um, you, you just really need rest, especially as things open up and you feel like you're not, um, you feel like you're not yourself and you have to adjust and this kind of overwhelming, maybe you can pray for a Sabbath in your life. And maybe if you're struggling with sin, um, Luke is a great genealogy. Lord, be my liberator. Give me rest from my sins. Restore me from my sins. Be that 7-7 seven, seven for me. Write all those names in my heart. You know, write that history into me. Uh, as you meditate on that, Actually, there are two things I yeah, just just those two things I want you to meditate on. But um, as you meditate, what I want you to do is your meditation shouldn't just be um, this is what I lack, and, and so give give this to me. But this information, this truth, the genealogy of Christ should attack a sin in your life. What is that sin? Like when you feel like you're number six, what do you do? Do you um, resort to your guile? Do you cheat? Uh, do you just get anxious? Do you gossip? Um, you, you gotta you gotta look for a sin and attack that sin with the truth. Okay, so it is, and, and if you just keep that pattern up for a long time, um, you'll find it fruitful. 
Okay, so right now, what I want you to do is pick one of these uh, ideas and I want you to meditate. Any questions? Okay, so the third one, it must attack one sin or brokenness in your life is, is for all. Like you have to think about that. Okay, I'm going to wait a little bit more. Any questions? Okay, I'm going to turn up my video and we're, gonna, we're just going to meditate. Okay, we're just gonna meditate and, and then we will get back later. 